Dankeschön. Good morning everybody and welcome we're going to read a song uh, we're going to read a song not sing a song read a song about two cities one city is the people of God and the other city are the enemies of God one city has a, a glorious future uh, the other city has a dreadful end let's read from uh, Isaiah 26 and from verse 1 in that day this song will be sung in the land of Judah we have a city strong. God makes salvation its walls and ramparts. Open the gates that the righteous nation may enter, that the nation that keeps faith. You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast, because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord, is the rock eternal. He humbles those who dwell on high. He lays the lofty city low. He levels it to the ground and casts it down to the dust. Feet trample it down, the feet of the oppressed, the footstool, uh, the footsteps of the poor. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our strength, our song. 
and that you have become our salvation. We give thanks to you. We call upon your name this morning. Help us as we seek your face, as we come before you with thanksgiving, as we uh, uh, worship this morning. May our worship be pleasing to you. We pray in the name of our precious Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing together that lovely hymn before the throne of God above. turn in our bibles to uh, exodus chapter 9 verses 1 to 7 continuing in the plagues and uh, let's read from verse 1 so exodus 9 verses 1 to 7 verse 1 then the lord said to moses go to pharaoh and say to him this is what the lord the god of the hebrews says let my people go so that they may worship me if you refuse to let them go and continue to hold them back the hand of the Lord will bring a terrible plague on your livestock in the field, on your horses and donkeys, and camels, and on your cattle and sheep and goats. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and that of Egypt, so that no animal belonging to the Israelites will die. The Lord set a time and said, Tomorrow the Lord will do this in the land. And the next day the Lord did it. All the livestock of the Egyptians died. But not one animal belonging to the Israelites died. Pharaoh sent men to investigate and found that not even one of the animals of the Israelites had died. Excuse me. Yet his heart was unyielding and he would not let the people go. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Now we've already seen four of the plagues. If you remember the water turned to blood. The frogs uh, everywhere. The gnats. Uh, and then the flies. Uh, and at the very least, because of all this, the cost of the food has gone up. 
after all the fish in the, the Nile have died, people are trying to get their food elsewhere, resulting in higher prices. I suspect the fields have suffered, if only because the work rate has dropped drastically. How can you do your job when there are frogs everywhere, when gnats are biting you, and when flies, millions upon millions, buzzing around your face and your mouth, your house, your hair, you can't leave the room because they're everywhere. It would slow you down, wouldn't it, at the very least. I suspect Egyptians were tired, not sleeping properly, uh, but most of all, I bet they were worried. Uh, you know, what's going on? Excuse me. What's going on? Um, why are our gods not helping us? Uh, what is God's... What, yeah, what, why are our gods not helping us? But I want to just briefly ask a question before we look at the passage today. What is God's plan in all of this? Well, uh, three things really. Firstly, he is showing Pharaoh that he is the true and living God and that there is no one else like him. Jeremiah 10 verse 6 tells us, there is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and great is your name in might. What an amazing privilege for God to reveal what he is doing uh, to a sinner uh, like Pharaoh. You know, to, to, to show Pharaoh, this is what I'm like. Pharaoh is getting a front seat on all of this. There was a time in the West where, God, where what God was like was largely accepted. We had come through the 16th century Reformation, the 18th century Great Awakening, the 19th century Second Great Awakening. Uh, and even if you weren't a Christian, you knew about the God of Scripture. Uh, but now we all live in an age where people either don't believe in God or have a God made in their own image. This is increasingly common. It's not the God of the Bible. It's a God as we think he should be. But it's a God of their imagination, and a God of your imagination can't save you. In fact, it's no different to the made-up gods of Egypt. Increasingly, we are like Pharaoh and his countrymen. We need this message. Secondly, God is exposing the futility of their religion. Their gods, their idols, are powerless to help them. There's a great passage in Judges. Uh, without getting into too many details, uh, chapter 3. God raised up a man called Ehud to deliver his people from Moabite oppression. Uh, and it's really quite a gruesome passage. Go home, have a read. Uh, but here's the thing. Where Ehud kills the Moabite king, he manages to get away without anyone knowing. And we read in verse 26, I'm sure the author is having a, a smile as he writes this. While they waited, Ehud got away. He passed by the idols. And escaped to Sarah. Um, not very good gods, are they? They didn't shout out. They didn't say, here he is, he's getting away. You know, he's killed your king and they say nothing. They see nothing, they do nothing. What good are idols? They, they're, they're hopeless. Now these plagues are, are, are shouting, Egypt, your gods won't help you. Your gods can't help you. I am God and there is no one like me. Thirdly, then, Israel has a front seat, a reminder that God is fighting for them. And they're seeing something of the greatness and the glory of the God of the Bible, uh, Yahweh, the Lord God Almighty. Remember our psalm for the year, Psalm 111. Uh, Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. A front seat. Now, we don't get it live like they did. Uh, but we still get a great view here of the great works of the Lord. And if we're wise, if we delight in God, we will ponder them. We will learn as we ponder something of what God is really like. So that's what we're doing. So let's, let's take a look at the next wonder, uh, the next plague, the fifth plague. A plague on all your horses, verses 1 to 2. Now Egypt is undoubtedly reeling there have been some strange things happening in the land and you can imagine them thinking oh goodness me perhaps the plagues have stopped no more gnats flies all gone still finding the odd dead frog perhaps 
but the Nile is flowing normally. Maybe things are settling down now. Incidentally, these plagues probably happened over a period of about two or three months. There are a few clues in the text, not least the date of the, the, the Passover, but that, that's uh, another story. Uh, so probably about two or three months. Uh, but your average Egyptian, perhaps getting back to work, uh, back to the fields, flies are all gone, worried about their gods, but doing what they can to get on with life. And we read in verse, uh, in chapter 9, verse 1, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, Let my people go so that they may worship me. Now, there's nothing really new there, is it? Just with the addition of the God of the Hebrews, it's pretty much the same thing as before. Uh, these are God's people and their purpose in life is to worship God. God wants his people to leave Egypt, uh, go out into the desert. Why? To worship him. And actually, nothing has changed in this respect all these centuries later. It's still what we're called to do. Uh, it should be a priority for us. In, in the church circles that I've been in, uh, catechisms have really fallen out of favour, which is probably a shame. Uh, but when you would come into membership, you would be tested on what you knew. You would have, they'd be asked questions and you would, if you didn't come up with the answers, you wouldn't come into membership. Um, and the only question I really know is, is this one, which I've said before, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Actually, that's not true because we do sing one, don't we? How many persons are there in God? Um, but it's a really helpful statement. The reason we are created is the same reason that the Hebrews are to leave Egypt. It's to worship. It's to glorify God. That's why God made us. That's why we meet together on a Sunday. We do it together. Uh, we, you know, we worship together. But it's not just that. There's a bit more to it. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. It says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Our lives are to be lived for God's glory. Every one of us, whether we're Christians or not, that's still what we're created for. Uh, we have many goals in life, don't we? Uh, we have things uh, we have genuine concerns about. We have various interests, various goals. But this one thing, but this one thing, the glory of God, our worship of God, is what we're made for. You are made to worship God. That's our top priority. Nothing's changed. The Lord isn't haggling with Pharaoh. Um, it's the same message. Let my people go so that they may worship me. Uh, and, and here's the warning. Perhaps a threat is a better word. I don't know if any different. It says it, verse 2, if you refuse to let them go and continue to hold them back, the hand of the Lord will bring a terrible plague on your livestock in the field, on your horses and donkeys and camels, and on your cattle and sheep and goats. Now, I don't know how it all worked, but I guess anybody could turn up with a rod to fish. Did they use rods or nets? Uh, if you had a boat, perhaps you'd use a net. Uh, and if you, what, what you caught was free. I presume that's the way. Whether they paid taxes on them, I don't know. Um, certainly livestock has a bit more value, doesn't it? You need to look after them. They could fall ill be stolen uh, but they provided you with milk uh, clothing uh, and of course meat uh, and now it's the livestock that is in the lord's sights but there's a little hint of something here that we might not notice three words and there are hints of the kindness and the graciousness of god even in the midst of his anger we read this a terrible plague on your livestock in the fields in the fields it's those three words now it's highly unlikely in fact i think impossible that word would spread quickly enough over all of egypt after all the lord has said it'll happen tomorrow so i, I guess 24 hours uh, but for those who were fortunate to hear this word from god they have an opportunity to do something about it to save some of their livestock by bringing it indoors out of the fields that's what the command is 
your livestock in the fields. Were there barns? Seems so. Mud brick buildings uh, to store grain and house animals. I'm sure many had the, the means to bring in animals off the field and thus save them, even if it was just the poor man bringing them into his home. There's some strange things going on around here. So if you're listening carefully to what the Lord says, you have hope. You can escape the serious consequences of this plague. You know, I'm bringing mine indoors. If you're wise, you'll do that. God's word is life, isn't it? It shows us how to live. It offers a way to escape God's anger. It still does. But unless you listen carefully, you can't be saved. Your animals will perish. Matthew 7 verse 24, the Sermon on the Mount. We read, therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Do you know uh, the parable Jesus told uh, that, that wise man built his house upon the rock? Two guys. One builds his house on the sand. The other builds his house on the rock. And Jesus says, it's like, listen to me. Uh, now, no doubt they're both nice houses. But when the wind and the rain come, when a decent storm blows in, crash, the one house collapses. The other house is fine. And the reason is the foundation. And that foundation is to listen to God's word. Listen carefully to God's word. To listen, as Jesus says, to these words of mine and put them into practice. Was anybody listening? Did anybody in Pharaoh's court pick up on these words of life? Uh, perhaps tell some relatives, uh, tell his neighbours and escape God's wrath poured out on these animals? By the time we get to the seventh plague, uh, we will see that some clearly had done because there's some more. Well, we'll see that when we get there. There's still some livestock alive. Some people were listening, even if Pharaoh wasn't. And of course, as we saw last time, uh, but the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and that of Egypt, so that no animal belonging to the Israelites will die. I remember uh, some years back, was it um, was it two thousand and one? There was an out outbreak of anthrax, and I would uh, I was a postman. I would deliver the post to farms, and, and some you would most would you at the very least have to leave the post at the end of the drive. Others set up things to wash your wheels in, to disinfect your wheels, um, because we know it's a serious uh, illness and it would spread. It's the same with COVID. We've seen that recently, haven't we? We had all sorts of things set up in place to reduce transmission. But here, the Lord says, I will make a distinction. This is a miracle. This is a sign and wonder. Just like how the flies last time just heading towards the land of Goshen where the Israelites are, they suddenly turn left or right where they don't enter. Flies. They don't bother the Hebrews. And it's the same here. There's a division. Not because the Hebrews are more godly. Not because of anything they've done. Not because God is impressed by them. We'll soon see that they don't impress God at all. It's the Lord's decision. The Lord has decided. The Lord has set, a lo has, has set his love upon this group of people. Now, we've been talking about this, some of us, uh, how to some it seems unfair that God would choose uh, some and, and not others. All I will say is that when Israel finally leave, uh, others who have seen what God has done decide to go with them. So they've got the chance, they've got the choice in that respect. We, we'll, we'll get there, we're not going to go down that rabbit hole this morning. But um, Psalm 111 again. Great are the works of the Lord. They're pondered by all who delight in them. Just as the Egyptians would be pondering. What's going on? Pondering these works of the Lord. Especially those who have brought their animals in. Yes, there's something to this. Just as the Hebrews would be pondering these works of the Lord. As they see what's going on around them. So should we. So should we. We should ponder God's ways. Uh, we who delight in what God does, we should think about these. We should ponder them. Let's second half of the sermon. Um, 
An inquiring Pharaoh, verses 5 to 7. An inquiring Pharaoh. The Lord set a time and said, Tomorrow the Lord will do this in the land. And the next day the Lord did it. Now, why should that surprise us? Why should it surprise anyone? Uh, the Lord said what he was going to do, and, and the Lord did it. You know, we're, uh, we, we, we believe these things. Uh, both sides are beginning to learn something of the greatness and glory of God, aren't they? Uh, the Hebrews who have perhaps forgotten what God is like are now learning it afresh. And the Egyptians are as well. Uh, and, and so should we, listening in, pondering, isn't God great? Isn't he amazing and what he's doing here? Aren't these chapters uh, giving you a sense of wonder and the greatness of God? We tend to just read them as narrative. But actually, when we slow down and look at them, they are great works of God. But will Pharaoh see it? We read, Pharaoh sent men to investigate and found that not even one of the animals of the Israelites had died. All along, Moses has been asking Pharaoh to send his people away. And finally, Pharaoh does some sending, but it's the wrong people to the wrong place. Um, clearly, he can see for himself the carnage. There's no denying what God has done. But he wants to see if God's people are really different. Was this some uh, natural catastrophe uh, or, 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 is what, or has what God has said really happened? Is there a difference? Is there a distinction between the Egyptians and the people of God? This, do you know, this is a theme throughout Scripture. And it starts probably, I think, just after Eden, just outside of Eden. Uh, Abel kept flocks. Cain worked the soil, we read in uh, Genesis 4. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought some fat portions uh, from some of the firstborn of his flock the lord looked with favor on abel and his offering but on cain and his offering he did not look with favor now we go on to read that if cain did what is right he would be accepted but he didn't he wouldn't and the first child ever to be born becomes the first murderer by the time of the flood there is one man against the whole world one man noah Solomon spells out this distinction in Proverbs and he describes it as two ways or, or two women. The woman wisdom or the, and the woman folly. They're the two ways. Which path are you going to walk along? Proverbs 8 2 says she takes her stand beside the gates leading into the city. At the entrance she cries aloud. You know, to you all men I call out. I raise my voice to all mankind. You who are simple gain prudence. You who are foolish gain understanding. She's got a lot to say. Lady Folly, well, she ain't no lady. The woman Folly equally entices. But we read that her ways lead to death. We then see this same distinction made uh, more fully in Jesus' ministry on the Sermon of the Mount. So Matthew 7, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. We've mentioned already the wise and foolish builders. He talks about good fruit. He talks about bad fruit. The distinction is probably seen most clearly in chapter 7 verse 21. Where he says not everyone who says Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only he who does the will of my father who is in heaven. So there is a distinction. And Pharaoh Pharaoh sends out his men to see if that is really true. If there is a distinction between the people of God in Goshen and the rest of Egypt. Are there really two ways in life? No doubt he picks his most trustworthy men and sends them with this one task. Have the Hebrews animals survived? Now scripture is clear. Um, among a large farming community, I'm sure there would be deaths, uh, especially with no vaccines, no uh, health care, no vets. Uh, depending on how large a community, possibly daily, were, would animals die of natural causes? Just as we don't know how many Israelites there were, we don't know how many animals there were. But these men, 
also had a close-up view of the greatness of God. Herd to herd, there were none dead, not even one. Isn't that a sign? Isn't that a wonder of God? We're used to it. We know the story. But here we're, rem we're reminded that the Lord is sovereign over life. Okay, in this case, animal life. We're reminded that God is greater than all of the gods of Egypt. They had a few more gods who were in charge of animals. Aphis, I think, was one. They're rubbish. They're rubbish. And it's a wonder in that we look, we stand amazed, and we worship. When we read of this, when we read the scriptures, it's so easy to read through and to miss it. But we shouldn't. We're wrong to. We should read and worship the mighty God of Israel. Surely, surely, this will convince the sceptical, hard-hearted Pharaoh. He sees the same signs. He sees the same wonders. I'm sure Pharaoh is losing faith in the gods of Egypt as everybody else in is. But we read, yet his heart was unyielding and he would not let the people go. Oh, people, soften your hearts. Don't harden them. Listen to God's word and obey. That's the way to do it. There are two ways in life. And Pharaoh is determined to go the wrong way. Back in Exodus 7, we read where the Lord said, I think it's verse 3, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Now, we, Moses hasn't, hasn't used those words yet. We haven't quite seen that yet. Moses hasn't written that. Uh, what we read so far is that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Next week it will change and the Lord will harden Pharaoh's heart. And for whatever the case, Pharaoh's doing it himself. Pharaoh is without excuse. Can you not see that? Can, can we really blame everybody else? Anybody else but Pharaoh? Pharaoh is responsible for his own downfall. He's hardened his own heart. He has had this front row seat to the greatness and the glory of God. And he has said, I will not accept. I will not see. He is without excuse. And with that warning ringing in our ears, let's not harden our hearts to the ways of God. He's come to set his people free. Initially, firstly, through Moses. But of course, as we know, it points to the cross. It points to the Saviour, to the Lord Jesus Christ, where he can set us free, where we can be set free from the slavery, from the bondage of sin. Do you know this Saviour? Soften your heart. Don't harden it. Turn to him now, I pray. Amen. Let's sing to close. Uh, before we do, we're going to sing allowing his presence. But let's just pray. A loving God, a Lord God Almighty, we thank you for the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable your judgments, your paths beyond tracing out. We stand amazed at the glory of God, the greatness of God. We who were by nature objects of wrath, yet because of your love for us, you who are rich in mercy made us alive with Christ. It is by grace we have been saved. So, Lord, we pray, may our worship be pleasing to you. And now may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. We ask for the glory of your precious name. Amen.
salvation, my own. Where dost thou, dear shepherd, resort with thy sheep to feed them in pastures of love? Say why in the valley of death should I weep, or alone in this wilderness roam? Oh, why should I wander and Sorrows they see and smile at the tears I have shed. He looks and ten thousands of angels rejoice. Thee.